Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this IIA webinar on the occasion of International Women's Day 2022. This year, we're delighted to be joined by two distinguished panelists from the world of the media. Last year for International Women's Day, we focused on women in decision making. And this year, we decided to shift the lens to women reporting on the decisions. Um, so my name is Hannah Deasy. I'm the Communications Director of the Institute in International um, the Institute of International and European Affairs. We're delighted to be joined today by Shona Murray, Europe correspondent with Euronews, and Mary Regan, political reporter, RTE News. I'll briefly go through the running order of the event before introducing our speakers. So this event uh, will have 20 minutes of general conversation between myself, uh, Shona and Mary, and then we'll move to questions from you, our audience. Please use the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask those questions. Um, the event is live streamed uh, on YouTube, so welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube, as well as those of you joining us on Zoom. We do encourage you to tweet during the event using the handle at IIEA. So I'll just run through the biographies of our speakers before we begin. Shona Murray is your co Europe correspondent with Euronews. Previously, she was political correspondent with the Irish Independent and foreign affairs correspondent with News Talk. Shona has specialized in Brexit and has reported from dozens of countries, including Israel and Gaza, Iraq, the Turkey-Syria border, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Sudan, Haiti, and Guantanamo Bay. She is also an alumnus of the US State Department Edward R. Murrow Program for Journalists. Mary Regan is an award-winning journalist who has covered politics for both print and broadcast for more than 10 years. She currently works as political reporter for RTE News, and contributes reports and analysis to a wide range of programmes for the broadcaster, including presenting the European Parliament report. She joined RTE from the Sunday Business Post, where she held the positions of news editor and public affairs editor. She was previously political editor of the Irish Examiner and UTV Ireland. In 2012, Mary was invited by the US State Department to take part in the prestigious International Visitor Leadership Programme for Emerging Young Leaders. So I note that both Shona and, and Mary have uh, participated in, in US State Department visits. So that's interesting in and of itself. As I said, the event is public and on the record and live streamed on YouTube as well. So to start the conversation, we wanted to frame this, I suppose, on reporting the EU because it's an issue that is of interest to us in the IIEA. But then equally, of course, Shona and Mary will regularly in their roles, you know, be thinking about how to frame EU issues when they're and um, putting together their reports and it, within the context of both international audiences and domestic audiences. But given the context of the war ongoing at the moment in Europe, I think it's more appropriate for us to start with a focus and um, covering that general frame of how do you make what's happening far away relevant to audiences all across the EU uh, and here at home in Ireland. Um, so with that, Shona, I, I know you were in Romania recently. You might talk to us a little bit about what it's been like over the past few weeks covering this international issue that's gripping all of us and, and really hitting home for everybody and how you do that for Euronews as distinctly for a domestic um, broadcaster. Well, I suppose with Euronews, because it, we're Europe wide and we have a huge um, viewership in Eastern Europe as well, Hungary, uh, Romania, and these are obviously the countries the front line of the Ukrainian crisis. So um, they have a huge interest in what's happening, particularly because I was covering the refugees emerging from Ukraine. These are also countries that are in NATO. These are countries that um, fear uh, Russian attacks, fear that their troops, NATO troops, if there was a Russian attack on any of their countries, would be brought into uh, a very large, wide international armed conflict. So it's very much um, these are countries that know the threat of Russia, have lived with the threat of Russia. Many of them have been under Soviet occupation or they were in the Soviet Union. And they've always had a concern about um, Vladimir Putin and his uh, re-emerging sphere of influence, particularly since the invasion of Crimea in 2014. So these are countries when you when you meet people on the ground, they know what they're dealing with in relation to Russia. They already have uh, fears. And then... Um, and then they have a strong relationship with Ukraine. You know, a lot of the people I met at the border were local Romanian um, community workers who uh, wanted to welcome their brethren, essentially, into Romania. And one thing, you know, I suppose for International Women's Day is that the, the most remarkable aspect of the people coming through were all women, all women my age, older, younger, 
carrying babies in buggies, you know, weeping, like just completely and utterly uh, despondent and despairing about what they left behind, their houses in the middle of the night, queuing in the snow for 60 hours to get through the border with little children who are just really traumatized because they want their beds. And here they are at eight o'clock in the morning and waiting to get into a snowy football stadium where the tent awaits, awaits them, not their father's. Their mothers are obviously fearful for the lives of their husbands because they've had to stay behind to uh, to fight against Russia. So it's a desperate situation. Of course, women taking on a lot of the responsibility by bringing through also elderly grandparents who could just about make it through the border, who again are fr frail. So, um, yeah, extremely, I have to say, extremely upsetting to, to see it because of, you know, all of this is just so unnecessary and, you know, should have been prevented but obviously, we know that Putin had strongly made up his mind about um, trying to retake uh, Ukraine a long time ago. So really, really difficult. But um, yeah, our viewership would be very tuned in anyway to European affairs. And Ireland obviously being much further away to Ukraine, not being a NATO member. We don't have that, let's say, consciousness about that sort of threat. And, um, and so it is different explaining to an Irish audience. But... Irish audiences are really tuned in as well when it comes to politics and um, and they certainly have been because this has been a war that has been pending for several months now. I mean, we, we've, we've been reporting of the on the um, the build up the 100,000 troops from Putin for almost a year. You know, since Biden came into power, that was very much a discussion in Brussels through NATO um, that and obviously the, the NATO uh, presence in Afghanistan. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, and I think as well, you know, the seeing these streams and streams of women and children coming it, it while we're talking about this is a very modern war. There's something that feels very ancient as well about, you know, women and children first escaping while men are conscripted. And Mary, from your perspective, you know, what's it like? This is a story that's been very present in, in Ireland, comparatively, perhaps to other international stories. What's it like covering this, you know, linking it to the Irish political scene and what's going on and trying to create that continuum between the two? Yeah, well, I guess it was very interesting listening to Shona there because she was very much emerged in the reality of what is happening and just those horrific stories of, of those women and children in particular crossing the border, just seeking safety for their families. Like for me, from my perspective, I've been covering it more from a policy point of view, from a policy perspective. Um, you know, any coverage I've done of European affairs over the past, I suppose, probably 15 years of my career so far. First of all, it was covering the Euro crash, the financial crisis. Then it was so Brexit dominated for so long. And I think this is the first time that Europe is really being covered from a, for an Irish audience that isn't related to, you know, a financial issue to a sort of um, technocratic issue to, you know, isn't represented as a trade block or, a you know, even a geography graphical space that Europe is really being represented now and it's coming across I think as Europe the sort of idea and the ideal of the European Union and what it stands for um, you know upholding democratic freedoms the rule of law all those sorts of things have really come to the fore you know in the past two weeks and that is very interesting because that's been different to how Europe has been covered for so for so so long. Uh, I was in Brussels, as was shown. Uh, we were covering the same uh, Euro Council meeting just the week before last. So Thursday morning was when uh, the invasion started. Um, I went from doing a doorstep with Michal Martin outside government buildings that morning, and I remember the questions we were putting to him straight away was, you know, what is Ireland's position here in terms of sanctions, and also can European unity hold when there are so many differing differing positions I think it was later that night I was in Brussels for the, for the meeting and uh, again you know from my point of view what I was covering it is you know so Irish people could really understand what Ireland's position was at the negotiating table what the Taoiseach was saying when he sat around the table with other world leaders it was interesting because there was a lot of focus at that point on the sanctions you know whether the swift international payment system would be included 
And what was coming across there is that Ireland did favour the strongest possible sanctions at that point. Ireland was amongst those at the table arguing for, you know, the SWIFT system to be included. And that's sort of what Irish audience was really, I think, wanted to know what Ireland's position was in relation to that. And um, later that morning, the Taoiseach came and did a doorstep with us in Brussels and we spoke to uh, Simon Coveney, Sean was there as well in Brussels that afternoon. Uh, I think that was a Friday, and Simon Coveney was was there to meet um, other other um, other foreign affairs ministers. And just during the course of that day, I think Ursula von der Leyen came out early that day. Nicole Martin and a number of um, EU leaders, you know. First of all, their main message they wanted to get across is that we are united. There is solidarity here. But I think they they came out in the morning and said, you know, these are the strongest, unprecedented, um, never before seen sanctions. And I think just almost just in real time as the day progressed, you could really see that maybe those sanctions at that point just weren't enough. And that happened very, very quickly over a very short, you know, couple of hours during the day. Um, Zelensky said, you know, that there was a quote that I stuck in my mind from that very morning. He said he just needed to look at the earth under him and the sky above him to know that the sanctions at that point were not enough. And he had made an appeal to the uh, European leaders at, at that council meeting. So um, it was clear that the pressure had been building, I think, throughout that day to the extent that uh, they came back with, you know, slightly stronger sanctions um, thereafter. And also, I mean, my main focus of my job is, is domestic politics, like over the doll mostly. And um, it's just been interesting from the point of view that we had one story dominating for two full years, COVID, nothing else. There was no political story, other political story, barely in town after an election that had been so dominated by housing. Um, the whole system was focused on COVID and um, with, you know, granted, you know, housing was, was also an issue and health and all those issues in the background. And then there was a bit of breathing space where we were trying to, you know, sort of figure out where the new post-pandemic politics would would fall. And then suddenly we're into another uh, big story very quickly after that is all consuming, all, all dominant and calling for extraordinary measures. So it's, uh, you know, I think that has been really interesting and just to see over time where it will leave Irish politics, there's already the legacy of the crash was already playing out over the longer term. Then there was the legacy of the pandemic that we were trying to figure out. And now there is this. So it's really going to fundamentally alter politics. But as as to how yet, we just don't we just don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I have, it's, it's fascinating. There was a brief window there where the news was just a little bit less depressing. And now it's, it's right back to very difficult to watch. Um, but we've been hosting a lot of events in the recent, in the past couple of months on, you know, how the EU is forged through crises and, and those have very much focused on, you know, the, the financial and economic crisis and how that then connects with the different response to the COVID pandemic and how that was informed. And it's almost seems that Europe's very unified response to this crisis has been able to sort of leverage the connectivity created around the, the pandemic. And Shona, have you seen any evidence of that at, at Brussels level, you know, of the greater, you know, the rapidity of the response? It's almost as if there was a sense that we can't let this drag the way we did at the beginning of the pandemic. We have to be fast now. Yeah, I mean, uh, the lessons were learned in the, in the early days of the pandemic, you know, because, you know, the, there hadn't been enough, let's say, cohesion amongst the member states. But that changed fairly early on when Ersert von der Leyen and the, the Commission knew that they dropped the ball completely. And the best thing that happened in Europe was the um, vaccine program amongst all 27 member states, because that Ireland wouldn't have had vaccines if we if we weren't a part of that. And it was slow at the start because of AstraZeneca. <coughs> Nobody knew that there was going to be a depletion of its um, vaccines that it could deliver to the EU. And there was obviously problems around that. But what it was, it did show that once the Commission works together and the EU member states are working together, they can bulk buy. They have this negotiating heft and that was the whole point of that 27 mem member states negotiating a good price and getting in on the market um, and I think with the sanctions I think it is separate to be honest with you because uh, one of the concerns around the sanctions is very political because there were some countries in particularly Hungary who has close relationships relationships with Putin so there was a concern whether Orban would would vote in favour of all of the sanctions and um and then you did have a very difficult, you know, that Thursday night, 
There were some countries, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, who were calling for things like carve outs for the luxury goods sector. They didn't want the swift international messaging system on the on the set of sanctions. And that's why, as Mary said, uh, on Thursday night, Friday morning, Zelensky and everybody kind of realized these sanctions are really not strong enough. And it just goes to show you that Putin was right, that the EU and the international community can't come back strong enough to, to parry him and actually do enough damage to make him resist his attacking Ukraine. And I think there was a huge feeling feeling of failure on Friday morning. I think that nobody felt, really, no matter what they were saying, these are unprecedented sanctions. They were unprecedented, but they weren't strong enough. And then within hours, you saw then that, doorstep Simon Coveney said okay Swift is going to be on this on the list actually Vladimir Putin is going to be on the list so is Sergei Lavrov and then on Sunday you saw them then suspending all the licenses for Sputnik for RT saying that Russian propaganda can no longer be part in the EU that air Russian aircraft were no longer going to be able to fly uh, above EU airspace including the, the jets of the oligarchs and it's really about and then there was more sanctions against Belarus and it's really uh, created huge momentum that uh, the US has obviously gone uh, alongside the EU and other countries and then other companies as well, you know, like uh, e or, you know, the various um, transactional companies, uh, Apple Pay, all of that kind of stuff. And it's created huge momentum. And I think that's been really remarkable. And I think it did start by everybody just saying, actually, we can't let this happen because it's not just um, Ukraine. This is an existential issue for the global rules based system. And we really need to act fast. And then you see the UK slightly lagging behind, you know, when it comes to the oligarchs issue in particular. But I think it has reestablished the importance of having the European Union there. Countries working together regardless of their um, their differences. And they had, there has been very many differences. In fact, I think you could e e the EU is characterised in some way, unfortunately, over the past few years, because of the differences between countries, southern countries, northern countries, eastern countries who are slipping into authoritarianism and so on. But now it seems like the EU has been replenished in an ideal. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I suppose coverage even of what's happening in Poland, it's the most positive yeah. coverage of, of Poland that we've had in our news for, for quite some time. Um, and we might come back to that in regards to, to gender equality in a while. Just continuing, though, on, on the vein of, of the Ukraine, I mean, Mary, obviously, in the domestic audience, there's now, you know, resurgence of questions around neutrality. You know, do you think that this is going to change our relationship with the EU in a, in a defence context now going forward in the years ahead? Yeah, I mean, I think it has to, and I think that's already apparent um, with what's being said over the past couple of days. But I think it's something that's always been there. I don't think it's a new question. I think since we joined the European Union, that question has always been there, but we never really had to, you know, confront it or deal with it. Um, so, yeah, there's, you know, and it, it's clear, you know, various party leaders and politicians sort of setting, setting out where they stand or where they feel about Irish neutrality at this point. But I don't think it's going to be something that is changed very quickly or change is something that can happen very quickly, you know, in response to what's happening at the moment. You know, I think it's going to be a very long process. This is probably the part that, you know, the real start of a discussion around this. It's probably something that would require ultimately, um, you know, uh, probably, a, you know, a constitutional referendum because for any sort of decision big enough of this nature would require the consent, I think, at least, you know, probably morally, at least of, of, of the Irish people, there would be a requirement to have, uh, you know, that consent there by way of a referendum. Um, but it's certainly something that's feeding into the debate here at the moment and something that wasn't anticipated at all just some weeks back that this is the sort of discussion we've been having now about Irish neutrality. I mean, it was just a few short weeks back that there was discussions around the funding and the resourcing and the financing of our defence forces and their infrastructure. So this is something that will feed its way more and more, I think, into the into uh, into into the debate, uh, certainly in, in, in the in the Dáil and in the Iraq this in the time ahead. Yeah, certainly the timing in line with the, the report on the funding, it, it's, you know, pushed the in issue uh, of our defence mm -hmm. forces front and central. Um, I'm going to go quest to a question from the audience, actually, because it's relevant to this aspect of the conversation. And um, it's from Peter McLoon, former Secretary General of Impact Trade Union and member of the IIA board. He asks, how are the Ukrainian media coping? Presume it is impossible to sustain printed newspapers. Have Shona and Mary contact with any Ukrainian journalists and what can be done to support them? 
Uh, well, we, we have our Ukrainian journalists that we use, like stringers over there uh, in Ukraine, but also we have our, our staff over there as well. Uh, I believe the, the the media is working very well. I mean, this, I mean, it's not actually, I think it's more of a, the problem, I think, is around Russian media. That's, I think, that's where you have a concern. The, the Ukrainian media is thriving because there's an awful lot to report about. Plus, it's in the, it's in the state's interest to have uh, this, this, um, war covered internationally globally and kept on the uh, agenda first on the agenda in every single country in the world in order to maintain the international community and it's and, and and spirit and so i think ukrainian journalists are uh, despite the notwithstanding the very threat to their lives that they're experiencing from russian um aerial bombing and you know street on street fighting the the the, the uh, it's thriving and then there is obviously you know a whole raft of foreign affairs correspondence in Ukraine as well. I think I think that, that that's not a huge problem, to be honest with you. I think it's Russia, obviously, where you have almost no, I think the last independent TV station was closed down recently. You have now jailing of, for over to 15 years for people who are, you know, inciting treason against Russia for condemning the invasion. That's that's where we have to be concerned about. Similarly, in Belarus, where there are 400 political prisoners, including Roman Protasevich, by the way, a, jur a journalist. I still can't get, get over that this actually happened, but where we know a few months ago, uh, a, a man, a journalist on a flight, a commercial Ryanair flight, flying to Lithuania, somehow over an EU country, was able to be taken down by Belarusian um, military and dragged off a plane and is now um, incarcerated and God only knows in what condition that happened. I mean, and yes, and yes, you know, for some reason we, we wondered that whether Vladimir Putin had it in him to invade Ukraine when things like this. And obviously we know Lukashenko, who is the dictator in Belarus, is, of course, uh, very close with Putin. In fact, he owes Putin his life and his um, his leadership of Belarus. Belarus is a satellite state of Russia, essentially. It's almost as if that incident's really, I think when the history of this is written, you know, that will be yeah. one of many warning shots. Yeah. Mary? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm, the answer is I'm not in touch with any journalists in, in Ukraine or any Ukrainian journalists in the same way as Shona might, might know some. But I think it's been very interesting to follow the sort of information war um, that's going on at the moment and uh, focusing on what's happening in you know, Russia, the attempt to, um, to, to essentially outlaw you know, Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and reduced you know, activities online. Um, also the, um, you know, the in, increasing you know, laws to, um, to jail journalists for 15 years, I think it is for, for fake news. Um, so, I mean, I think what's happening to journalists in, 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 in Russia is obviously of more interest, I think at the moment in terms of how, and, and the way information is being shared in Russia and in seemingly so many people not being aware um, of, you know, the, the, the whole pretext for the war in the first place. And so many people believing that, you know, the, you know, the point of this war was something that Ukrainians had had wanted. Um, so I think the information, um, you know, poverty in, in, in Russia is something that really has to be focused on. It's quite astonishing to watch actually. Absolutely. And, and I suppose the, the broader point, obviously, around, you know, journalist safety, I'm, I'm interested to get your views. The, the EU has a Media Freedom Act planned for summer 2022. It's part of the European Democracy Action Plan. And we recently welcomed Commissioner Vera Jourova, where she spoke about it. Obviously, the situation is very different in different member states, um, but they do have a recommendation on the safety of journalists following, you know, high profile as production that you're talking about, um, shown of Roman Prasevich, but also then the murder of Daphne Karuna mm. Galizia in Malta, to what extent do you think that, you know, and safety of journalists across the EU, specifically not even the broader um, picture, is an increasing issue in recent years? Well, seriously a concern actually in countries like Hungary and Poland, where we know Viktor Orban has been using uh, Israeli spyware against journalists. That's endangering their lives because who knows what uh, he's going to use that information for. You mentioned there Daphne Karani Galizia, but also the ability for journalists to do their job, where in Hungary, Orban has a stranglehold on the media, where his cronies buy up all the media, ensure that any independent newspapers don't get any advertising. You know, 
these are real problems um, because they ensure that people like Orban get re-elected in an election soon. They, the type of propaganda he spouts, like the Polish government spout, whether it's relate, whether it's anti-Semitic relation to George Soros, whether it's about the EU trying to impose its liberal sort of values uh, on Hungary or Poland, which is not the case. Uh, we've seen those countries slide into authoritarianism when it comes to gender equality, not just uh, Hungary, Poland, but Slovenia as well. Um, under uh, Janusz Janša, who, who, uh, who has withdrawn or withheld public funding for state uh, media in Slovenia, meaning that they can't do their job. Um, but of course, and, that, and they, are, they are just so happen to be the, some of the companies that are critical of him and some of his policies. So that's what Vera Jourova is trying to do. I mean, she's from the, she, the former Czechoslovakia and she talks frequently about how important it was to join the EU and to be a part of a, an ideal that, that um, had solidarity with journalists and the importance of free press. And that is sliding very significantly in those countries because it allows those authoritarian regimes and governments to stay in power because they're told all of these lies and there's no independent press to explain it and so it's very problematic but also the fact that like i said hungary is surveilling journalists that's extremely dangerous and we just don't know where that's going to end hungary remember is regarded as no longer a democracy mary did you want to come in on that um yeah so um yeah so i you know i think obviously shown as you know given a good account there of the sort of sliding of press freedoms in certain countries, particularly Poland and Hungary. Uh, but I think it's one of the other aspects that doesn't really get talked about a lot is that these journalists in these countries are caught not just between the, um, you know, their governments and the, and the, you know, authoritarian type regimes on the one hand, but also they're competing with big tech giants on the other hand. And, um, you know, they, they, <laughs> They, they don't have the, you know, the finance, the resources to fight back and, you know, compete as it were, you know, with information sharing. So I think that's definitely something that needs to be looked at. But I think across Europe, uh, through the pandemic, we've seen it's not just journalists in certain countries who are coming under pressure from their own governments. It's also journalists in countries, including Ireland, uh, have come under pressure throughout the pandemic, certainly uh, through various protest movements. Uh, the abuse of journalists online has just you know like it's just gone so bad over the past year or so um you know death threats to journalists even though they may appear benign and even though they may just be you know people mouthing off there are still very sinister um attacks on journalists through platforms such as Facebook and Twitter and you know I think something that needs to be looked at is whether those platforms want to do anything about it or not you hear constantly of journalists reporting things uh, you know posted about them or posted to them on social media and very little is done about them these people can have their accounts taken down one day and re-established the following day so I think for most journalists um, that is a big issue. And I think, you know, as we were talking here today, I think it's a particular issue for women journalists seem to experience this sort of online abuse. Um, speaking to my female colleagues, it it's, uh, seems to be more uh, pronounced, you know, these, these, these attacks on women rather than, rather than on their male colleagues for whatever reason. So uh, that is something I would like to see, you know, um, these tech companies taking a little bit more, more seriously and, um, it's one thing taking down really offensive tweets, but, you know, maybe they should just consider not publishing them in the first place. That's really interesting. And I was just going to ask whether it was similar to, to women in politics for, for female journalists, um, you know, that, that there is that increase in the vitriol really experienced mm. just by going about and doing your day to day job. Yeah. Um, and Shona, is that something that you've experienced with your colleagues in, in Brussels as well? Yeah, I mean, I think. Yeah, Ireland and Europe, there's, there's a lot of these conspiracy theories that we've seen where the mainstream media, quote unquote, gets caught up with this sort of, um, you know, the global conspiracy theory. So, you know, it's part of the establishment. And I think that there's a, there's a large distrust of uh, the job that you do, even though it's extremely frustrating because you literally just want to, to do the right thing and tell the truth. And that there's, li there's nothing else in it other than to do that. I mean, really there isn't. And I find that very frustrating and I find it increasingly coming into my own life, not just online, but people I know, let's say friends of friends, 
when they find out you're a journalist, it's actually it's a it's a it's a moment of distrust. Uh, oh, right, like, oh, you're one of them. You're you're spouting spirit <clears throat> theories about vaccines or or whatever it is, or too cozy with the establishment, or too or or that you don't um you, you basically are a mouthpiece for whatever it is organization, um, you know the the EU or the government or whatever, which is just not true because you spend your whole life, you know trying to chase people who don't want to answer your call who don't want to answer your questions and um, you know and you just you are trying to I'm not saying that every journalist does right they don't because we look at the state of some of the tabloids in the UK for example I mean like they're they've you know caused a huge amount of problems with the likes of Brexit with them um, the likes of denying climate change attacking migrants you know they've whipped up fear and they're not good so not every but but, but when you are trying to do the right thing I find that quite difficult and sometimes it is a female thing but sometimes it's more just this this hatred of the of the media and you see it a lot in RT as well you know the protests outside and it's extremely vitriolic and violent actually and yeah I find it difficult and it does happen in Belgium as well there were a lot of conspiracy theorists there was a lot of protests violent protests around the EU as well and continuing on actually the disinformation theme we have a question in from Alex Conway um, IIA researcher and I'm going to read it out because it's quite long. With reference to the information war, do the panel agree that the EU was right to take RT, Rush Today and Sputnik off the air? Is this an effective way to combat dis or misinformation and the weaponization of the media? Or is it heavy handed censorship, which has legitimized the Russian banning of foreign media? It's a very difficult question because in the past, I would have been uh, all about the marketplace of ideas you know, which is kind of what Twitter is and what what the, you know, what, the whole point of having all of these different views that the truth prevails because we're able to target all the lies with truth and then people see the facts. But that's unfortunately not what's happened over the past few years. When you see the amount of people who are in ICUs because they believe vaccines are X, Y, and Z, who've been told lies. Um, and, and also what Putin has been doing for the past, well, over a decade, interfering with the US election, for example, that allowed to enable Trump to be elected by lying about Hillary, by, you know, by uh, the lies about Brexit. All of this has been a lot of it Kremlin orientated or Chinese orientated. The, the level of disinformation that has emerged over the past few years has been really shocking and extremely damaging to democracy. And, um, and so I would never have agreed to doing that. But if you look at some of the stuff that RT says and Sputnik says, they have given Russian people a completely wrong view of what's happening in Ukraine, that it's being run by Nazis. I mean, this like I mean, we have our own MEPs, Claire Daly McWell, saying things like that Assad wasn't responsible for um, the chemical weapons attack or that, you know, uh, Zelensky is a, a Western puppet, um, you know, or that the white helmets who are people who pull decapitated children out of burning buildings because of Russian barrel bombs, that, they, that they're actually linked with Al-Qaeda and they stage all of these attacks. They don't. They don't. And I know them some of them personally. And so at that point, you have normal people go, well, hold on a minute, these white helmets aren't even in these. And these are actually people who risk their lives. So propaganda has gotten us to this place where it's actually created so much fragmentation and dissent uh, um, within Western democracy. And that's why I can understand getting rid of 14 Sputnik because they are only propaganda. And so what, what do they bring to the table? They don't even bring a proper debate to the table. They just tell lies. And now you have Russian soldiers in Ukraine, for example, believing that they're there to liberate and then they find that they're not wanted. Yeah, I, mean, I would be similar to Shona in the sense that I would, as a journalist always have been any against any sort of state or government or in this case the EU as a whole involvement in um in the sense of you know banning any particular type of media or you know trying to control it or anything like that it's not a very good precedent to set and it's not something that you know the state should really have a role in however we do live in a time where disinformation is now such a huge problem and you know causing so much damage to democracy that something really probably needs to be done at a policy level to tackle this sort of scourge of, of, of disinformation um, but it's something that probably should be done not in a sort of responsive kind of way you know 
as, as being done at the moment in terms of a response to what's actually happening at the moment, it's probably something that policymakers you know, in, in, in all parliaments need to examine, you know, what can be done about disinformation. Ultimately, it requires, you know, an ethical framework for social media organizations, I suppose, in the sense that we as journalists, you know, we, we, there is a huge sort of ethical and philosophical foundation to what the media does and why we do it. And it's something we all study as a discipline before we come into journalism, most of us do. Um, but the, the sort of way information is shared on social media doesn't, you know, be, doesn't have the same sort of ethical framework around it. Um, so that's that's something that needs to be done. But you know, I think as as sort of policymakers need to look at what can just be done in terms of disinformation, and it might be just something that requires more education. Although that those those that route has been attempted, and it's just something that hasn't really been working so far. I think we've got to a situation where, you know, the goalposts have shifted so, so dramatically now because of, you know, what was once hoped to be the sort of democratization of access to publishing and publishing information through social media platforms. But it's really, you know, proved to us the importance of what were gatekeeper roles and editors and fact checkers. And, you know, the, what was, was a great promise is actually turning into a sort of dystopian nightmare, really, because we have you know, more and more need to, to develop new ways of fact checking. And, and obviously there's great work being done within that and some of it's funded. And here in Ireland, the journal.ie are obviously doing huge amounts of work on, on fact checking. But, you know, how, how is it possible to, to even put some sort of structure of gatekeeping or fact checking on when everyone is everyone can publish? Well, I mean, it's possible for news organizations. It's been mm. possible for yes. every newspaper yeah. that ever existed since the beginning of time. It's been possible for every radio station that existed more or less since the beginning of time. And many newspapers have had to close down as a result of it because they have to pay for editors. They have to pay for gatekeepers. They have to pay for fact checkers. And if was, you know, if it was a sort of free for all for newspapers, then in the same way as it does appear to be for, for social media organizations, then you know, a lot of newspapers that have since closed down wouldn't have had to. It's interesting as well, because obviously this is an area the EU has, you know, attempted to legislate on, and I, I assume will continue to let, attempt to legislate on, but where the tech companies have had massive lobbying uh, operations. And we have a question in from Ben Tonra, Professor of International Relations at UCD. He says, thanks for the terrific session. And um, now this touches a little bit on, and we talked about it before, but we might drill down a little bit more. Is there any sense from the colleagues about the media landscape in Russia and what are their reflections on the apparent ineffectiveness of new media in getting any story across that doesn't jive with the regime's propaganda? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. And we talked about it earlier because that the issue is not uh, the media in Ukraine where it's, it's vibrant and obviously journalists are probably working 24 seven, let's face it, notwithstanding the, the bombs, the Russian uh, bombs. But it is really interesting listening to correspondents in Russia who say that, you know, the majority of Russians are listening to the propaganda from the regime. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, in some parts of Russia not having internet access and also just watching what they're used to, uh, whether it's RT or, or some of the other uh, stations. And also then the crackdown, therefore, on anyone who wants to be an independent journalist or an opposition person. They have to do it from outside Russia because they're targeted consistently by Putin's um, regime. I mean, and that's and, and so it's not just Russia, but we mentioned it earlier. That's what's happening in Hungary. Orban is buying uh, or his cronies, at least, are buying up um, independent uh, uh, newspapers and or and or ensuring that the pro Orban newspapers and media outlets are getting all of the advertising. Independent radio is losing its um, its licensing. So it's it's happening already in, in Hungary and Slovenia, like I talked about as well. Yeah, Janusz Janza with withholding. Uh, vital funding for state media th when though that state media is ever critical of them. So journalists are losing their jobs. In the interim, they end up having to find new jobs. So then you don't have journalists in the industry anymore because they have families to feed. So it's not just about Russia. It's actually just it's happening. and It's creeping in very slowly in the EU, which is why we have that uh, media commission um, directive for 2022. But it's very hard to see how that will make a difference because 
these countries, they've gotten away with not ha implementing rules of law for so long. And also we're in the midst of a, an armed conflict here where unity is just has to be sacrosanct. So is Brussels going to start interfering with Jansha and Orban and Kaczynski in Poland in the middle of this crisis? I'm not so sure. But what's happening, you know, for some time now, we've been talking about Orban using Putin's tactics in relation to the media. And, um, and, and that's kind of what's emerging now. Sorry, I can't remember the question exactly. So just... Um, it was about the challenges for the mm. media in Russia, a new media in Russia, in getting any story across that doesn't chime uh, with the regime's propaganda. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, for all we're talking here about social media and stuff like that it's um going to be interesting to see because he has cracked down on on facebook on twitter on social media it's going to be interesting to see what degree of success that's going to have and so far it appears that you can't in the current media age we live in you can't ban information it's impossible it's almost i saw some quotes somewhere someone saying it's like almost trying to um, ban oxygen you know it's so omnipresent it's so um, ubiquitous amongst us at the moment that it's impossible to ban so it will be interesting to see how social media can be used for information to get across and for information and crucial information to be shared and whether there will be a positive aspect out of that in a sense that it appears that Putin is now losing the information war and the other side of that is how um, you know Zelensky has paid, played such a good social media game and how he has used social media really to really good effect um, to get his message across to to really speak to audiences absolutely everywhere in the world you know people are sharing uh, you know his his videos sharing you know so many aspects of his communications uh, so commonly now so the information he he's been using it to, to great effect so um you know we we'll just have to have to wait and see how, how things play out in in russia in, in in that sense how how people manage to get that information across but i suppose that the i mean the law of 15 years in prison for sharing misinformation quote unquote is going mm. to uh, obviously ensure that people are too frightened to pass on information or journalists are frightened to to read it but i did see some videos in moscow of police not just uh, arresting people at a protest, but uh, randomly checking people's phones to, ch to, to, to have a look and see what they were sharing. So it's a complete police state and that's really difficult. Whereas, like as Mary said, in contrast, Zelensky talking to the world with his 15 second or one minute videos and also the, the image that the Ukrainian army is portraying or cre uh, creating or curating, I should say, uh, of when they, when they take a prisoner of war they're showing videos of them being fed, calling their mothers. The conversation with the mother is, I'm not in Crimea, I'm not training, I'm in Kiev, or, you know, um, and and then uh, the world can see that the Russian soldiers were, you know, uh, lied to by Putin and that they don't want to be in the middle of this armed conflict and that they, on the opposite side, Ukrainians are far from Nazis, but actually engaging the proper way uh, they should be when it comes to Geneva Convention, the protector, protection of prisoners of war. So it's really showing the two contrasting sides, the aggressor and then the innocent uh, country that's defending liberty and Europe. And there's some remarkable examples emerging as well, I think, of innovative ways to get information across. You know, we've seen um, that there are people writing reviews on restaurants in Russia, mm -hmm. you know, we, that are not reviews. They're actually yeah. descriptions of what's happening. And um, equally, I've seen a t I saw recently saw a TikTok of a woman showing how to use an abandoned tank, um, you know, in the Ukraine. So these are really, you know, there's so many aspects of this conflict that are deeply different. But Zelensky's curation of, and his relationship with the media is particularly interesting. It touches on a broader point I wanted to get your views on around, you know, we often talk about the EU's communication problem. But every now and again, when a really large, significant figurehead comes along, it's much easier to draw attention um, to, to whatever issue it is that they that they spearhead. And Zelensky seems to be doing that extremely in, in an extremely savvy way. And um, do you think that's made a difference to how people are engaging with this? I'd say so, yeah. I mean, that week when the, the EU, or the, so the invasion was on Tuesday, that Thursday was the big meeting about the sanctions and Zelensky appeared to the EU27, um, appealed to them to have the strongest sanctions ever and said, I don't know when I'm going to see you again or if I am. And actually, um, 
I spoke to several sources after that and they, this sounds just perfect, but they had priced in, this is the word someone used to me, that Zelensky may not make it past the weekend, that weekend, because, you know, he is number one on the uh, hit list or kill list from the US and decided to stay and fight and refused um, a, a ride, as he called it, from the US. He said, I don't want a ride, I want uh, tanks, basically, and arm, armaments. And so he he deserves like, the valour that he's getting because of the way he is leading the fight and he's leading it for the greater good. And he, and he says that all the time, we're Europeans, we've proven that we're Europeans and it's also about him becoming a fully fledged member of the European Union and the price we're paying, we will pay for, for membership of the EU is the blood of our people. And so all of that strikes a chord with everybody because it does hark back to the creation of the European Union itself, but also that people can't help but feel, well, you know, he's doing it for the greater good of humanity and for democracy. Absolutely. I have another question from the audience here. It's shifting a little bit to the focus. Um, it's from Karen Harty in McCann Fitzgerald. So Karen asks, we've seen very concerning attempts to undermine public service broadcasting in the UK recently with the BBC's funding placed in serious jeopardy. Do EU states need to take specific steps to protect public service journalism? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. I think it's um, it's definitely something that you know has has to be stood up for i think people need to realize the relevance and the importance of public service broadcasting at this time and uh yeah i, I mean i mean means and ways are being examined as to how you know the, the funding models can work and that's something that's being examined for many countries across europe um it's not you know it's probably too big of a question to get into right now but i think uh Definitely, you know, the sort of uh, the public requirement and the importance of public service broadcasting has never been as relevant as it has now. Which is true. But if you have a if you have a government that doesn't want public service broadcasting the way that it should be, then we're in trouble. Like I said, Hungary, Poland, Slovenia, those countries, they don't want independent journalism because that means that they have they come under a spotlight and their corruption, misuse of funds breaches of rule of law, you know, the abuse uh, against migrants, against the LGBT community, that's found out for what it is. And so it's very difficult for the EU to intervene in that way because these countries are ones that will say that there's an overreach from Brussels. They use the same sort of um, tactics mm -hmm. and rhetoric that we see say, on the UK. Brussels is this, you know, boogeyman. Brussels is only actually what the 27 member states make it to be. Every country has a, a deciding vote on the most fundamental issues. So there's no such thing as Brussels per se. Um, and the only way the EU can really intervene, I mean, they have the, like we mentioned, the, the Commission's directive on media freedom, but it's it's very hard to implement that stuff. The only way you can maybe look at it is about, is around the area of competition within the single market, that there has to be enough competition uh, and that countries can't allow monopolies um, exist or prevail. And so, this, so there could be ways around, around that, but it's very, very difficult. And even with this new uh, re um, regulation that we have um, in relation to rule of law, that only deals with EU funding rather than the media. So it's, it's very difficult when you're coming up against the likes of those um, governments. But maybe we're learning, maybe we'll see um, at the end of this that we can't actually let that backslide and continue because look what happens when you ignore it for so long, which is what we did with Putin. Um, I'm interested as well in this, this idea, you know, that, well, Brussels is what it is in terms of who's in power across the member states. But around this Brussels, the boogeyman idea, you know, national politicians do that, whether they're in an authoritarian illiberal democracy or yeah. actually in a democracy. And Mary, how has it been for you, you know, when you're, putting together a European Parliament report, as opposed to when you're reporting on an EU Council. You know, the sort of difference in terms of what you're hearing from MEPs in Strasbourg about a piece of EU legislation versus what an Irish politician might be saying about it at home. Like, have you ever encountered a, a disconnect there? Well, I think the, the whole um, question for MEPs, Irish MEPs, is just to get their position across and get policies they're, wor they're working on or get whatever they're doing across in the Irish media, which is something that they tend to find very difficult. Um, you know, the European Parliament is supposed to be the sort of democratic counterbalance, if you like, to the other EU institutions. Um, it's, the mo it's the only one in, in, in the sense that directly elected MEPs, but I think people find it 
um, maybe sometimes a little bit, you know, unaccessible. Um, there are reasons for that. I mean, the the system of voting there is quite complicated. You know, they have these sort of voting blocks that people can't see, let's say, a debate happening on a particular policy and then a vote at the end of it. Sometimes the the, you know the debate happens and then the vote is, is a little bit further down um possibly the sort of accountability element isn't very easily accessible for the european parliament so for example let's say at the start of the vaccine procurement process i'm just thinking off the top of my head billy um billy kelleher mep was raising a lot of questions about how what the commission was doing and billy keller did stand up in the european parliament for his one minute to speak but Ursula von der Leyen had sort of gone out the door by the time he was speaking, you know, so it doesn't have in the sense what national parliaments have the ability to stand up and question and, you know, Q&A session, nor does it have something like, let's say, for example, the PAC, you know, there's no sort of accessible way that people can see the European Parliament doing its job of holding uh, the other institutions accountable and um, maybe pushing them in the direction of a certain policy and things like that. That is the biggest kind of question, I think, for MEPs. Um, so in some ways, it, you know, often comes across as maybe a, you know, a, a very high quality debating chamber, whereas, um, you know, it, it obviously is an awful lot more than that. And it's, you know, something I try and do when I'm doing European Parliament reports is, is, is to sort of, you know, get across, you know, the Parliament's exact role in this bigger policy that's coming to pass. For example, you know, in 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 the vaccine, um, the vaccine uh, pass, the the COVID pass system, in the procurement process for for the vaccines, um, in things like the you know the 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 decision a few weeks ago, just in the European part, or, you know, to um to to cut the funding for for countries in breach of of rule of law so um yeah that's just something you try and get across the 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 role of the people you directly elect to the european parliament what they're trying to achieve for you out there thank you and um, before we we're coming up to, to two o'clock actually so I, I might just given this was our international women's day event um and the conversation progressed as it did given you know events and the context which is very valuable and thank you very much for the time we've covered on that might just come to some of our gender equality um, questions. And, and you mentioned there, of course, Ursula von der Leyen, first female president of the European Commission, the gender, gender equal college of commissioners now for the first time ever. To, to what extent, and of course, women leading the European Parliament and the ECB at the moment, to, to what extent do the two of you have a sense that, you know, these figurehead um, politicians being women, you know, there being more and more women in these key de decision-making um, positions across the EU, does that have a greater impact on gender equality issues being to the fore than policy-based initiatives like the EU's Gender Equality Action Plan? Um, does it make a difference? Does it shift the dial? I think it has to, because um, like even if you look at what's happening in, in Poland uh, with relation to the abortion legislation, you know, that 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 the government there is trying is rolling black back. And it's actually just been pretty horrific. There've been, I think, four situations very, very similar to Savita Halepanavar in the last few months where women um, uh, have gone into hospital hemorrhaging or miscarrying and caught sepsis because they, they refused to remove the pregnancy, even though it, would, it was there was going to be a miscarriage. That was going that was going to be the case. Um, and so the legislation there is completely rolled back when it comes to women's rights. And so naturally this is a women's issue and so women obviously if you're in a, a position of power you're conscious of it maybe if you've had a baby or you've had an abortion or whatever it is and so I think it, it, it's taken for granted and then you know er, women who've come through the ranks of politics will have ex, will have inevitably experienced sexism and have and, and found it difficult at some point and found it something that they probably felt along the way was something they need to change not all women of course but so naturally it does, um, it, it's almost like the, it, it should be taken for granted that it's something they're trying to pursue along with everything else because it's equality anyway. And like even Roberta Mazzola, who's the president of the European Parliament now, she has voted against um, a motion introduced before, which would say that abortion was a human right. But she said, um, you know, her own position 
is what it is, but she will always, she will forge the position of the European Parliament, which was to support that motion. So she understands uh, the nuances around these things, which I think is really great. Because she said, her own, it's a bit like Neil Martin when he voted in favour of repealing the Eighth Amendment. His own personal view is, you know, not pro choice, but understanding legislation was important. So when you have people like that in power, it does eventually do that. And Ursula von der Leyen being very she was very sure about ensuring there was power, gender parity. And she suffered her own thing. Do you remember uh, about a year ago, Sofa Gate in Ankara, when uh, she was meeting Erdogan, the, pre- the president of Turkey, and Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, and her were both on a visit. And she was basically put in a sofa, and then two men sat on big chairs. And that was humiliating for her and she talked talked about it emotionally about her humility and how she was left alone and she was and it was actually quite a despicable reflex by Charles Michel because um if you look at the video he he he, he realizes the situation and he steps forward with haste to ensure he gets a chair so he's not undermined without thinking oh hold on a minute this is going to make us a look stupid divide us and also we're going to undermine my uh my female counterpart or whatever partner um, in, in, in the commission, the council. So, um, so yeah. And so I think on that basis, you know, everybody recognizes when those things happen that they they can't happen any longer. And, and we are like, even I always think about it, like five, 10 years ago the, in Ireland on the radio or the TV, it would be completely normal to see four men on a panel discussing often women's rights, you know, abortion or the eighth amendment, whatever it was. You would never see that anymore. In fact, it would just be laughable to see that on RTE. You, you know, they just no producer would do that. Whereas before, that would no producer would question it. So I think things have changed now. To <clears throat> and you look back at the way things were, and you go, "How did we allow that? That's insane." So, mm. um, so I am kind of optimistic in that regard that those sort of ways are just intolerable. Yeah, and I think just as Shona mentions that, thinking back to when I was a younger journalist and working in newspapers. Uh, Any time I appeared on a panel, it was usually just, you know, th- three men and then, you know, I was the only woman at the end of it. And uh, as Shona said, that just doesn't happen anymore. But I think it was really um, great to see just a couple of weeks ago, the European Parliament, the last sitting they had in Strasbourg, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, Roberta Mazzola and Christine Lagarde, the three of them were there discussing um, the discussing the euro, discussing inflation, and they were the three big figureheads in the parliament. So if nothing else, if the policies aren't even there, that in itself is a really important image. And the difference between covering the European Parliament and covering the Dáil, for example, is in the European Parliament report, it's very uh, normal to have uh, you know, a, a news report, a TV package, or whatever it is, a discussion that is more women than men. Whereas when you're covering something in the doll, it's very, you know, often not the case. And just in terms of policies, I think we, we could look at, for example, the difference between the doll and the Shannon at the moment, there is uh, far greater female representation in the Shannon. And it's really coming across in terms of the policies that the Shannon is, is putting across. You know, they just have motions recently on reproductive leave, on, uh, you know, funding paid IVF treatment, all those sort of things coming out of the Shannon, which ha- didn't get, you know, pursued in the doll, you know, and haven't. So, and, and then they're feeding into the doll discussions. So I think for that reason, um, the, you know, the greater, participation of women the better but you know the European Parliament I think has around just 39% uh, female representation it's higher than the national the the average for the national parliaments but it's still obviously a long way off total parity yeah (laughs) unfortunately we will get there but if if Ireland could get to 39% soon enough that would already be a a step forward it would take a long time (laughs) And um, before we finish up, I have a question in here now from Francis Jacob, um, which is how can the Irish media build on public interest and concern on the EU response to COVID and the Ukrainian crisis um, to ensure future interest in the debates in Ireland on the future of uh, Ireland's role in the EU? So I suppose, you know, coming back to this issue, of, you know, you're talking off about the EU outside of the moments of extreme crisis and the EU's role responding to extreme crisis. Mary. I think once people start paying more attention to decisions being taken at an EU level and how they impact so directly on their lives. So I think the the COVID pass was a very sort of tangible thing that was, 
you know, decided at an EU level, and this is, you know, a policy that 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 you can see very apparent in in, in your everyday life. And I think once people start seeing that, you know, in some ways, um, you know, it it, it opens doors in some ways to to, to looking at 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 the EU uh, differently. Um, and I think. You know, beyond that, it's it's only our job to report what's important and what's necessary, um, and it's up to EU institutions, you know, them, themselves to make themselves relevant. And if if something is relevant or important or matters to the public, then it will be reported on. Thanks, Mary. And Donna, I might just adapt the question a little bit for you, just in regards to you know, with the European Pan European Network, international network. Um, to what extent is there, is there an appetite in all, each member state for, for news from other member states rather than just from Brussels? So, you know, I'm thinking of the women you were talking about in, in Poland, you know, some of us have heard about that here, but it might not be on, on the 6-1, right? You know, and mm-hmm. the same, you know, tragic murder of, of Ashley Murphy, you know, to what extent would that be reported on in, in, in other member states? You know, is there a, a solidarity between audiences? Is that developing? Is it growing? You know, how, how do you seek to get those stories that matter from one country to another country's audience? Well, Roberta Metzola spoke about Ashley Murphy um, in her inauguration speech about women uh, who mm. didn't get the opportunity to, to strive, but who were amazing in the life that they had. And her and other uh, journalists who had been murdered, including Daphne Caruana Galizia. And obviously Brexit features a lot in all other countries. And, I, and it's been remarkable how... In how much interest there is in German media, in Spanish media, in French media about the Northern Irish border, the backstop, the, you know, the, I mean, the all island economy. It's incredible because I go to all of these briefings, you know, the Brexit briefings, and the questions are just incredibly well informed. And they're, they're just as any Irish journalist is informed, even a journalist in Belfast is informed, the level of detail they go into, whether it's SBS checks. I mean, so that's so, so that exists a lot. Um, I think more so actually in European countries than in Ireland, if I'm honest. We we don't to talk in Ireland about what's happening in Hungary and Poland. Um, and we will do soon, probably, because we're a net contributor to the EU budget. So if there's misuse of funds in those countries, which it's why 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 the acknowledge is particularly happening in Hungary, um, then that's Irish taxpayers' money as well. So, and, and, and Michal Martin's actually been quite strong about this of late, before the Irish government really stepped outside this. But he said what Poland is doing is a slap in the face for all EU other countries. That was a very strong statement to say to another member, say on the day of an EU council meeting when he was going to meet the Prime Minister of Poland, you know, hours later after saying that. So I, Ireland is getting a bit more involved in it. And I think um, the other issue is that the EU has made some incredible, unprecedented um, moves towards further fiscal integration because of the 750 billion euro EU fund, which was totally unprecedented. That couldn't have happened, um, you know, 10 years ago when people wanted euro bonds. So and then with that, the EU procurement uh, plan for COVID vaccines was successful albeit a slow start that there's even there was even conversation about doing that for energy that the eu buys you know energy because of the other prices now not all member states wanted that so um so that so so these things are directly impacting people's lives and the covid search is a, is a great example as well because there was an eu wide program but then um 50 odd countries adopted it adopted it because of the eu so it's showing the sort of so-called brussels effect and that's why i think i think that more and more because of that integration and interdependence um the irish media will have to start picking up as to what's happening in brussels because it does it's much more um directly affecting it's not just um you know brussels bureaucrats coming up with these sort of uh, other proposals they're actually much more tangible Mary, do you want to, to come back on that before we wrap up? Yeah, I, I think the past number of years has definitely seen, you know, a lot more coverage of EU affairs, decisions being made, even the European Parliament. What's happening there, I think, is um, getting increased coverage, um, particularly through through COVID and through Brexit. And I think that's something that's only going to continue now. Uh, I was struck to see the special sitting of the European Parliament was it what was it what day was it uh, where Ursula von der Leyen addressed the, the parliament um you know in, in response to what's happening in Ukraine and that was streamed live on the on RT News now it was also streamed live 
on Sky News and I was watching going, wow, like the European Parliament is, is, is live on, on Sky. That's definitely something that you wouldn't really have seen ever before. So there's definitely, um, and to a, to a British audience. So I think it's definitely uh, something that people are, are, are watch, keeping a close, closer eye on. And I think that might remain for some time. And it's actually interesting that point Mary made there, particularly on Sky, because the UK has obviously left the EU. But if only there was that level of coverage and understanding before the Brexit referendum, then people would have been more conscious of it. Because I covered Brexit in the UK, in Bolton and Scotland and all. And, and any person that was voting out you know, to leave, it had nothing directly to do with Brussels. It was to do with, you know, local uh, council decisions or, you know, you know, really, really things that were just jumbled because of then, of course, we had this propaganda from Farage and so on. So actually, I think it is important to critique the EU in the way in the ways that it should be criticised. And let's face it, there are so many ways it should be criticised, particularly at the start of the, the pandemic and so on. And it may, um, and then also to understand how it does impact your life and how you can positively shape it by sending the right people to Brussels um, or just having ensuring that your government is accountable for the decisions it makes at a Brussels level. Thanks very much. Now, I'm, I'm going to draw this to a close because we've gone a little bit over, but I want to thank you both very much um, for this discussion. Um, it's been very wide ranging um, and, and equally also then for the role you both play uh, as sh in shown as a just sum up there in providing that um, impartial information um, to, to the viewers of both in Ireland and, and across Europe. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. This recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and with that, we'll close today's event and wishing you all a very happy International Thanks. Women's Day tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you.